<clears throat> Ready for this? Hello everybody, my name is Sarah Colley. I am the Community Engagement Coordinator for the Great Falls Public Library. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. We are thrilled to have you on this uh, Tuesday evening. Right, it's Tuesday? I always get something wrong. <laughs> but here at the Great Falls Public Library, we are here to serve as a connection point to empower the community and enhance the quality of life by providing individuals access to information and social, cultural, and recreational resources. Some of the ways that we do that is to provide talks like this and others throughout the year. So uh, stay tuned on our website for future upcoming events. There's always something new, always something exciting going on. Now to get to the fun part, the introductions, and then the actual fun part, the reason why you're here. Craig Lancaster is here. He is the author of 10 novels and a collection of short stories, a body of work that includes two High Plains book award-winning titles, 600 Hours of Edward, and, and It Will Be a Beautiful Life. His 10th novel, Northward Dreams, was just released and is the reason why we are all here this evening. Kristen Inbody is um, right alongside Craig tonight, and she is a reporter and an author. Kristen co-authored a guide to the Montana State Parks, which I absolutely love, and has, has provided photographs for many different works. She is a world traveler and has reported in many different states across the country and across the whole state of Montana. And with that, I thank you all for coming tonight, and please... Help me in welcoming Kristen and Craig. Oh, it is well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's Tuesday, but the important thing is it's Happy Librarian's Day, so Ooh. we're in the right place to celebrate. <laughs> and our audience has grown amazingly from our last event at Great Falls Central Library, so. We tripled it. <laughs> yes, yes. Fantastic. All right. Well, congratulations on Novel 10. Thank you so much. Um, the quantum physics book remains my favorite. Really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the short stories. Okay. Yep. yep. I All right. That. Well, this is, seems like a very personal story. Um, so, do you want to talk about a, a bit about that and how that kind of sped you on your way? This was a quick ride? Sure. It? Yeah. So, um, I have taken to describing Northward Dreams as, yeah. I have taken to uh, describing Northward Dreams as the book I was born to write, which sounds a little inflated, I think, because, you know, it's like, you know, this book had to be written, and My here destiny. I am to save the day. I don't really mean it like that. I just mean that um, the book is heavily informed by the story of my family. Um, now, the fun part of fiction is that you might have a precipitating memory, but then imagination gets to do its thing and you end up with something altogether different. So, when people ask me, oh, so this stuff really happened, I go, no, it didn't happen. It didn't happen at all, at least not in the way that it's in the book. Um, but what's interesting about being here tonight, I, I suppose, is it's Great Falls has so much gravity in uh, aspects of this story, particularly my dad's story, and the, the, the stuff that I uh, stole from him. Um, you know, and so it's kind of fun to come back. Last time I was here, you were up in the Fairfield bench. Yeah. And that like, also figures into your, your story. Yeah. Um, not in an enthusiastic way, though, I would say, like the charm yeah. they stole. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my dad had a pretty horrible um, life on the Fairfield bench, and, uh, and that has informed his life and uh, mine as I've tried to understand um, the life he's led. Um, and I try. I try really, really hard. You know, I'm his primary caretaker, and just about everything uh, that is kind of messed up in that relationship is bound up in things that happened up there. So, um, so fiction is one way of dealing with that. Yeah. There are a lot of father and son angst. Yeah, yeah. My mother asks me, you know, well, how, come, how come you don't write about mothers and sons? And I go, well, you, 
you're a pretty good mother. You didn't really give me anything to work with, you know. My dad, uh, my dad is a good man, but, um, you know, it's like dealing with a, emotionally, it's like dealing with a 14-year-old. And I specifically did not have 14-year-olds. And then I inherited one. So, yeah. yeah. How old is he? He'll be 85 in June. Yeah. I think everybody, including him, is flabbergasted that he's <laughs> made it this far. So. All right. Yeah. Um, the way you described your characters in the uh, book trailer was, um, I don't know them in my memories, I found them in my imagination, and I grew to love them, um, love them there in your imagination as the story came out of me. Um, do you love them? Are you fond of them? I am. They're difficult. Every, yeah, every, but every last one of them. Um, and it, which is bigger than just empathy, which I think is the essential thing to have, you know. If, if you're writing fiction, you've got to achieve empathy with every character, even the ones that you just don't understand, you know. Uh, but all of these characters, yeah, I, I fell in love with them, you know. Um, even in some cases, I, as I led them to, well, they didn't, I didn't lead them, they led me, but, you know, they ended up in not-so-wonderful places, you know. Um, could you talk a little bit about the unusual route to get this published? <laughs> How long you got? Um, <laughs> so the short answer is that two years ago I signed a two-book deal with uh, my pre previous publisher, uh, the one who published um, And It Will Be a Beautiful Life. I was very happy with that book. Um, the book um, did well, at least in terms of claim, if not, you know, it was actual, a great book. actual sales, um, and, kind of everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, where would you put it, um, and, uh, I, I was excited to continue that, and so, uh, this book was supposed to be book one of that two-book deal, and it was supposed to come out last June, and it didn't, and it kept sliding month to month, you know, well, it'll be out soon, you know, and I would just watch it, and I finally said in September or October, I said, let's just, let's just kick it to spring of 2024, you can get your stuff together, we can, you know, we can sort of draw in a deep breath and do this thing the right way, and in late January, I was on a Zoom call with him and my agent, and I said, uh, book's still coming out on March 12th, right? And, oh, yeah, yeah. And then a couple weeks later, well, no. And um, so we got to March 11th, which was a Monday. All books come out on Tuesday. It's a weird publishing thing. And so on March 11th, I woke up to a letter uh, from this guy to not only me, but all of his authors that basically said, uh, we don't have the expected funding. I'm taking two weeks off to shore up my personal situation. Don't ask me any questions because I don't have any answers. And I thought, you know, this book is going to come out in sort of a haphazard way, like it was going to be just the ebook, which was so weird because we had always thought of this as this is a book we're on a position for bookstores. You know, this is. This is the kind of book where you want to put the physical artifact in people's hands, right? So pretty. Yeah, and so, so I, I wrote to him and I said, you know, cancel the book. Cancel the book, don't let it out. Revert all the rights to me, I'll take it from here. And to his credit, he did. I think he felt awful about whatever jam he had gotten himself into. And um, I took that week and feverishly prepared it for, uh, for publication, and I pushed it out the door myself. And so it was supposed to come out on March 12th. It ended up coming out on March 19th. I, uh, I, say, uh, I say I lost a week and I gained my book. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to do that with every one of them, but with this one, I, I'd had enough. And then how did Kickstarter figure in? Well, Kickstarter, I just, you know, people kept asking me, you know, well, how can we help? Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, you know, buy the book, review the book. 
And, and then I thought, well, I'm going to be doing all these events, and I'm going to need to advertise this book. So I said, you know, if you really want to help, I, I, set, a, I set a fairly small goal. I set a $2,000 goal. I said, if you really want to help, here's the, here's the Kickstarter campaign. And it ends tomorrow. Um, people funded it to 193%, which was just wonderful. And uh, that's going to give me a little capital, you know, to do some things for this book that hopefully will push it out. I, uh, you know, I have to work for, for a living like anybody else, you know. I'm a payments analyst. Man, if you want to be excited after the show, <laughs> man, come talk to me about interchange and payment rails. It'll be, it'll be so good. Um, so, so, yeah, that'll really help, and I, I'm really grateful for everybody's uh, generosity. Do you think he'll uh, pursue that kind of model going forward? I sure hope not. I mean, I would rather, I would rather have a partner. I would rather have somebody who's better positioned than I am to take on some of the marketing. I, I, I'm always going to have to do some of the marketing, and I like it. I like doing stuff like this, but... Boy, you know, being the guy who really has to account for everything is, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's more of a chore than I feel up to. Mm -hmm. But I also thought, you know, I can do this. I can do this for this one book. You know, so I'm going to take the rest of the year off. I don't, the next book, wherever it ends up, is already in the can. I'm done with it. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm just going to. I'm gonna see what I can do this year and then reassess. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, um, are you are you hopeful for where your characters are going next after after the close of what you wrote on your book? Is there gonna be a sequel? Is this? Are you envisioning them in happy days? Uh, I I never know about sequels. I. I, uh, I made a big mistake with 600 Hours of Edward, which was my first book, and I was like, ah, you know, I'm done with that. <coughs> You know, there have been two subsequent Edward novels, so, you know, don't pay any attention to <laughs> what, I, what, I, what I say about anything. Um, but I will say, um, just as a consumer of stories and, you know, the kind of stories I respond to, I'm much more interested in the suggestion of future change in characters than I am even in what that change actually looks like. And so... When I get to the end of, the, of a book, whether I wrote it or read it or whatever, I, I like the idea that I find them in a place that's different from where I found them when, when, when I began, and that maybe there's hope, and mm -hmm. maybe there's, um, you know, whatever, <coughs> whatever horrible decisions have led them to the, where you find them at the beginning of the book, that... They might make Your some horrible decisions of taking <coughs> people in horrible directions. <laughs> I mean, yeah, your own yeah, course. yeah. I mean, yeah. It's. I just think that's you know. I always say this. You know, as long as you wake up on this side of the dirt every day, right? You have a chance to do things in a different way that might might work out a little better. You know, so. And they do make a lot of really bad choices. They do. So, yeah. There was a, I'm going to read a couple bits. Okay. Then we can discuss. <coughs> well, just tell me page numbers. All right, 34. 30, oh, okay. All right. So 34 is the uh, 2002, 2002 timeline. There are four timelines in this book, 1952, 1972, 2002, and 2012. So, all right, what all right. am I doing here? Here's your family. You don't know them, you might not even come to like them, but they're yours, and you're now a carrier of the story they've given you. You can expand it, write the next turns in a different color of ink, turn slapstick into sorrow or prosperity into horror, but you have a responsibility to the underpinnings. I really like that. It just kind of set up the whole thing. Like, here you go. These flawed, very flawed people are yours, and um, they they all seem to kind of acknowledge that I'm making my own mistakes. But at the same time, it's in this context of this messed up family. Yeah, I I think about 
where stories come from a lot. Not just, you know, stories I write, but just stories people carry with them. And, you know, you're not born into this world a, a totally blank slate. You, you have, there are stories that are going to be told to you from the moment you can understand them. And, um, and then that affects how you process information, where you go from there, what your biases are. And um, yeah, I, thought of, I thought about this a long time ago in the context of my mother's father, my, my grandfather, who was a Minnesota farm boy and born in 1919, he went off to war and saw horrible, horrible things. And the man who came back to the family after the war was not the same. And, you know, we heard about Grandpa's trauma. You know, I, I knew... What did they he, call it, though? Oh, uh, it wasn't shell shock, because that wasn't what he saw. He saw, he saw brutality. Mm -hmm. He saw... He saw you know, murder and ugliness, and he, so we didn't really have a euphemism for it, it was just, you know, we knew that he was damaged by it, you know, and so the people who knew him before he went off were like, oh, well, you know, Sid wasn't always this way, you know, and, and so I thought about that, you know, like, that, it was his story, but it, is mine too, you know. They they told it to me, and so same same thing with my dad and the the jump that went on up on the Fairfield bench. I mean, he was brutalized. He was absolutely brutalized, and there is no way to deal with the man he is without knowing that that those things happened to him. You know, you know. My mother has been divorced from him for fifty one years, and. You know, she's she's like, I can't believe I was ever married to Ron. You know, like she, she saw the flaws, you know, uh, and the damage up close. But I've always looked at him and gone, you know, his big, his big success in life is that he didn't roll that stuff downhill to me. Mm -hmm. You know, he didn't, he, he never hit me. And when you, when you realize that violence is generational, you know, it takes a lot. It takes a big, big person to stop it there, you know. So, so I give him a lot more credit than other people do, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we were talking earlier about Jamie Ford and yeah. his uh, latest book, and I wondered if you had thought in the context of the story about generational trauma in terms of epigenetics and if that is written in the DNA. Yeah, yeah I, didn't, I didn't think about it overtly, mm -hmm. but... But I really, when I read Jamie's book, I mean, I really responded to that because you know everything, everything that I know anecdotally, you know, supports that idea that you know these things happen and they don't just stay where they happen; they spill, you know. So, um, you know, this book sort of reimagines some things, you know. When I was three years old, my mother looked at my dad and said, I want a divorce, I want, I want out, I want to go somewhere else, I don't want this for me, and I don't want this for our child. Um, Electra, in the 1972 timeline, does things a little differently than my mother did, and my mother's still alive and kicking and wonderful and beautiful, and, you know, Electra doesn't make it out of the 1970s, right? So Did she not have a sports car for a getaway? Yeah, oh, oh, my mom did have a, okay. a 68 Firebird, in fact. Okay. Yeah. That's and, the best way to make your escape. Well, and you know what? They, she and my stepfather sold it to buy a new air conditioner. <laughs> it's the worst transaction in the history of mankind. Although, well, although we grew up in Texas, mm -hmm. so it was probably good that we had the air conditioner, yeah. So... But anyway, um, yeah, so slightly different thing. So I reimagined, you know, sort of what, what would have happened if um, my mother, something had happened to my mother when I was still young, and, um, and my father had reasserted his rights 
and said, okay, well, I'm, I'm the boy's surviving parent. Um, man, you know. And so then I sort of apply that to, you know, invented people, and it becomes this really interesting thing, you know. So. When did your father actually kind of reinsert into your life? Well, he was always there, you know. I would, um, I would spend summers and every other Christmas with him, but it was... He was a uh, he was a uh, exploratory well digger. So so I spent summers. You know, we were talking about Sydney, Montana. I spent the summer that I was 11 years old in Sydney in a hotel room, a motel room. I don't have any hotels. Yeah. So. Well, some uh, people got to spend <coughs> decades in Gla uh, Glendive. So, yeah. Um, you yeah. know, it could be could be better. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it was just all kinds of strange outposts in the West, right? Mm -hmm. Like. Uh, Cuba, New Mexico, and Lyman, Colorado, and you know these were the places I spent my boyhood summers. I had some interesting thoughts about Wyoming as well. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. My first home, yeah, Mills, Wyoming, in the bedroom community of Casper. Oh man. Yeah. Oh, Casper's not my fave. Uh, Casper blows, like literally. <laughs> yeah. 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 Windy, ugly. Yeah. Um, we talked about spilling over. Um, alcohol was quite a common theme throughout the story, kind yeah. of. Um, completely unrelated to real life, but animates a lot of bad decisions or yeah. directly related to. So I'm going to read another passage. Okay. Um, this lady's watching her mother uh, go down that road again. Um, Sherry is her name, and her mom's Anna. It's everything she loves and everything she resents right here in the magnitudes of a single human. Sherry knows it's a simple binary to Anna's way of thinking, to the extent that she's even aware of what she thinks about anymore. These are good times in drink and pain, unspoken and undefined, and yet surely present beyond it. And when they didn't have a good time, Anna would, would say, if asked, up there together, warbling through sad summer nights, Anna taking the Travolta parts, Sherry handing, handling the Olivia Newton-John. For Sherry, though, every pixel of proposition exists in Technicolor, save for the one element that's black and white. You want sobriety? Okay, stop drinking. Yeah. And, uh, no, it's a hard route to that for all these people. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, um, if you've had alcoholism in your family, you know, you realize it's not... I mean, some, some folks drink every day all the time, but it's the starting and not being able to stop that does the, you know, that, that, that's where it manifests, mm -hmm. you know, um, especially, especially with, you know, functional drugs, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, there was, there was a lot of that um, that went into it, and, you know, and, and, uh, Anna has that particular problem, and so does Nate, who's in the, uh, well, he's a little boy in 1972, he's um, an adult in 2012, which is the, the most recent of the timelines, and yeah, yeah, he's, uh, he's, got, a, he's got a problem, mm -hmm. for sure. Do you want to just kind of introduce the main animating event that causes, kind of starts the story in motion? Yeah, so um, the book has a, uh, a pretty tightly woven structure. Um, there are th four timelines, there are 32 full chapters, so eight chapters for each of the timelines in any group of four chapters you will find each of the timelines represented. And then there are uh, what I call interceding chapters. Um, there are nine of them. They bookend the book and then seven spread throughout that are focused on individual characters and those uh, break loose of the main timeline to sort of illuminate those characters. So. Um, so in order, you've got uh, 1952, you have uh, a 16-year-old named Ronnie who is a runaway. Uh, he's working for a kindly farming couple. 
uh, but he wants to find his dad. In 1972, you have Electra and her little boy, Nathan, who are uh, running to a new life in Texas from Ronnie, who's now a grown man. Um, in 2002, you have Sheree and uh, Anna, and they are uh, settling uh, their uh, Sheree's grandmother's estate in Billings. Um, and then 2012, Nate, grown grown up Nate, you know, 45 year old Nate or however old he is, and Ronnie are coming back to Montana for the burial of. Ronnie's sister. And eventually, the, all four timelines find their way to each other. And um, yeah, it was, it was really weird. It was, you know, usually I'm just kind of a by the seat of my pants guy. You know, I just start and I finish and, you know, figure things out. But I, I've likened this to building a bridge one stanchion at a time without a blueprint, you know. so. So I'd put four stanchions out there and then build the road out and then look and see where the shore is, you know, and then try to figure out, okay, well, what's the next one? You so know, what, what do I need to reveal next, right? Um, did you write all the 1950s stories at once? No, no, no I went in order as it okay. appears in the book. Yeah, okay. yeah, so. All right, there are lots of people who have on their, on their way to Montana. Um, which they're nervous about. Oh, in 2012, right? In 2012, right? so yeah. um, the guy's going back to where he was abused, the old man. Yeah. Um, and then this is, uh, and then is the old man Ronnie and his middle-aged, 50-something-ish son, yeah. uh, Nate. And Nate's about to become a grandfather, and his son is not the screw-up that these two are. So yeah. well, that's something. Right. Uh, and they're just about to lose their relationship with um, the non-screw-up in the family. Yeah. So, uh, Brandon. Brandon, yeah. The crossover into Wyoming brings a tightness to Nate's gut and an unease that spreads out inside him. He wraps the center of his chest a couple times, scaring up a belch that smells of what he poured into himself, which would be beer. <laughs> Sorry, you got a problem, kid, Ronnie says. That's the old man waving in the air. Several Nate thinks. A good number of them close enough to punch. The truth is, he'd been dreading this part, this entry into the state of his birth, a place with no mooring for any of the ways in which he identifies now. It doesn't help that they'll be driving across damn near 400 miles of the state, which the worst drive in the West. <laughs> Sorry. Have you, have, you gone, have, you, have you gone the other way across? Yeah, I have gone I think north to south, yeah. crossways. <laughs> Yeah. Through Jackson Hole, the good way. Anyway, <laughs> Wyoming. Um, meaning he'll be wrestling for hours with something he can't even name. He remembers his mother telling him, there at the end, when every word was a gift, that this was the state in my way. Wyoming. He can feel the weight of those words now. I just like the way you word that, and I have my own beefs with Wyoming. So. Okay. <laughs> Me too. Yes. Yeah. Well, many of your characters end up in Wyoming. Yeah. For better or worse? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wyoming, uh, Wyoming was my first home. Um, I was born in Tacoma and adopted at birth. And mm -hmm. the family that adopted me lived in Mills, which is you know just north of Casper. So, you know, three of the best years of my life that I cannot remember <laughs> took place there. Yeah. All right. Well, you had marked some. Uh, pieces of your own that you yeah. liked. Yeah, I to read. So I usually read uh, the second chapter. I won't read all of it because it's a little bit long. Um, I'll just read part of it. It is that Mills, Wyoming. Mills, Wyoming. <laughs> Which I just heard. Yeah, we're 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 just gonna say in Wyoming <laughs> um, because what Electra does, you know, her her decision to go is crucial to every part of this. And so, um, so this is, it's the night before she's going to leave. So uh, this is October 1972, Mills, Wyoming. It's the best part of the evening on the nights when Electra can have it. 
and there haven't been nearly enough of those she's come to find out in just a few months of wanting them. When Ronnie is on some highway somewhere, to Omaha and Des Moines and back again on this run, but it could be anywhere, and her boy is in bed and Charlie's voice is coming over the line like in the Glen Campbell song, she can run the extension from the kitchen to the bedroom, fall back onto her own pillow, close her eyes, and imagine something else, something better. Something not this, anyway. You're all set, Charlie asks. The words come out tender and loving, even if they never invoke that word, love, when they talk. And yet the question is also fixed with a bailout she can hear, should her answer not be what he's hoping to receive. She gets the feeling he's been holding back just a little, just in case she can't manage this thing she proposes to do. Well, Charlie Stidham, you beautiful man, prepare to be pleasantly surprised. All set. Car is packed, she says. I'm gone at first light. I'm glad, he says. I've been waiting. Me too. She laughs behind the words and gets a quizzical what in response, and she knows it wasn't funny at all. It was entirely serious and entirely terrifying, actually, getting to this fraught point, but it's just how the remembrance of things strikes her now. I loaded the car in about 300 trips Nathan never saw, she says. He's down for a nap and I run out with a suitcase. He's in the backyard and I put the cooler in there. He's eating his macaroni and I slip out with my purse. Didn't dare touch his toys or he'd know, so I'll grab those in the morning. I was dodging him all day, like a spy. You haven't told him? No, she says, not yet. I think he knows somehow. Not much gets by him. But I figure it's better to fess up when we're on our way, and any fussing he does will be within the car doors. Perspicacious, Charlie says. What's that? Nathan, you said not much gets by him. He's perspicacious. The rhythmic tumble of the syllables in Electra's ears pleases her in a way she wouldn't be able to explain and wouldn't want to share with anyone else anyway. Charlie has been doing that to her for going on four months now across long-distance phone calls that always originate with him in Texas, lest they be found out, and always find her in Wyoming and must be putting a terrible dent in, her, in his check register. They're nothing, really, and yet also everything, his little asides, the crumbles of conversation he pulls out and examines, the way he tells her without saying so explicitly that he's heard her, that she has something to say and something he ought to acknowledge been a long time since she's felt that from someone else. He's closer to her now at two days of hard driving than Ronnie has been in years. When she realized that, there was no backing away from what it meant. You're so funny, she says. This is why, you know. I know. You know how I feel. I know, he says. Me too. She sits up, reaches into the end table drawer, and withdraws the little satchel she's been hiding around the house moving it daily in an abundance of caution or a surplus of paranoia. It's been in the pantry, where Ronnie would never look, and even in a spare tire in the garage, where he well might, a prospect that spooked her so thoroughly that she snuck out in the night and moved it into Nathan's closet. She opens the satchel and fingers the cash she's gathered, enough to get where they're going and then some. She checks to make sure her driver's license is there, the social security cards, the birth certificates. All is in order, same as it was an hour earlier and an hour before that, and will be in the hours yet to come, when she'll surely keep checking. She closes the satchel and flips it to the backside, where the tiny hash marks she's cut with her fingernails sit stealthily, not even noticeable unless you know what you are looking for. One for every phone call, 22 now, and she uses her brightly painted forefinger to make another, 23. 23 phone calls with Charlie, and one night in person that she holds close like something holy, and collectively those are the fulcrum by which she's going to wrench open the now and make a faithful leap toward whatever tomorrow's may come. No chance he'll, Charlie starts, and she cuts him off with a terse, no, none. Okay, he left a few hours ago, she says, softer now, probably not even in Nebraska yet. Okay, good. Electra looks at the clock. Late where you are, she says. I guess. I'm not going to be able to sleep, I don't think. Me either. But you need to, he says. Yes. I'm going to let you go now, he says. Tomorrow night. You call me collect. Let me know you're okay. I'll be okay when it's done. 
but in the interim, he says, and she smiles and assures him, saying, I'll call, you can count on it. You know how I feel, he says. You know how I feel. That's, that's it. So. All right. So yeah. how do you think it would have been different if she had snuck out in the night in a sports car with her son who doesn't know what's happening? She's very confused. Um, and her husband on the road. Yeah, she, I mean, she, she ponders that question at a couple of points, and I think she's scared that she wouldn't do it otherwise if she didn't just break away. You know, and like I said, it's different from the way my mom did it. When my mom, my mom waited for him to come home and then told him I want a divorce and I want to go. Um, but, you know, the destination was the same. There was, there wasn't a man waiting for us in Texas. He came up and got us after the divorce, you know, but, um, so little things changed, but um, you know, I like I like that bit because I think there are people. I mean, I've been divorced. I, I think there are people who've been through divorce who might be a little angry with her that you know that she does it that way. You know, like uh, come on, you know, just don't don't just leave. You know, but again, empathy. You know, I, I wanted to understand, well, okay, what is it that she senses in the situation that makes her think that's the way to go, you know? Because it's hard. It's, it's hard, to, it, and she has to, there's things about it that cause difficulty for her later, you know? So. This is why I wrote a guidebook. I don't have enough angst. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm brimming with it. Oh, yeah, good. so, yeah. Um, so what was it like to write a book with your wife? It was, uh... Another book. What was the name of that book? Uh, you, Me, and Mr. Blue Sky. Okay. Yeah, it was more of a romantic comedy because that's what she writes. And I figured I could, I could bend to her way of working easier than she could bend to my way. Um, it was surprisingly smooth. It's interesting. I, I'm glad we did it and probably will never do it again. Um, just because, I, you know, she's got stories that she wants to write and I have stories that I want to write. It's hard to... But, you know, we worked well. We, uh, you know, we, we would take turns. We'd take turns. There were three POVs in that. There were, there was, you know, it was a kind of a traditional romance, a romantic comedy. So there, there was, you know, the way the guy assessed it and the way the... the the woman assessed it, and then Mr. Blue Sky was the guardian angel for both of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the way we changed it up is I wrote the woman, oh. and she wrote the man, and then we took turns. Mr. Blue Sky was such a fun character because he was uh, he was a guardian angel who was obsessed with 1970s culture, mm -hmm. and so which is just such a terrible decade to be obsessed with. Wow. <laughs> oh man. Oh. I was born in 1970. I love yeah, that decade. Yeah, that's part of the problem. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Things didn't get good till the 80s. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. Or that's we true. go all the way back. It's true. 50 yeah, 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 yeah. I'm a 1940s and the 1970s guy. I, I, yeah, yeah. Film, definitely 1940s. Um, but anyway, I, yeah, we both wanted a piece of Mr. Blue Sky. So that was probably the hardest part was just to make sure you know, she writes differently than I write, so we had to do some heavy editing to give him a calm voice, you know. Did she feel like that you nailed the women's perspective, or did she have to be like, ooh, no, I'm not I think I think on both sides there were pro probably a couple of instances of us going, yeah, <laughs> that, that wouldn't happen, you know. <laughs> but um, I, I think, I think my interpretation of the woman probably made her a little um, less soft than, than my wife would have made her, and her interpretation of the guy made him uh, a little more sharing and caring than I would have made him, but, you know, I think, I think both things augured to the benefit of the characters, so, uh, you know, just simply because, you know, there are tropes and stereotypes and all that, but the fun is breaking away from those things, so. 
How about Duran Duran? She also writes about that, right? Are you going to get into that? She's, she's like the hugest Duran Duran fan. And I was aware of them and didn't, you know, we're the same age. I didn't, I didn't have any particularly strong feelings about Duran Duran at the time, you know, when they were really, really big in your favorite decade. Um, <laughs> That's just when good but, things started going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I do, you know, she's got a particular love of John Taylor, the bassist okay. for Duran Duran. I didn't know that. So I, uh, I am sometimes apt to pull a print out of him and draw devil horns on him. <laughs> You're not going to uh, weave him into your next book? Uh, yeah, I just, he's, I mean, he's, you know, he's 60 some odd years old now, so he doesn't look like the map, you know, he doesn't look like the the hot young boy he was in 1983, so, you know, I, 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 concert this summer, I, I can, yeah, yeah, so yeah, I, yeah, so I'll tease her, I'll just go, you know, we saw him in concert, and he has a little bit of a, a little bit of a beer belly, and I, I said, you know, he's a pot bellied freak, <laughs> um, ooh, yeah, fight words, <laughs> yeah, and he also has a tattoo, but he's got these skinny arms, and so I'm looking at it, I go, is that a tattoo of the Gerber baby? <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Well. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing the marriage is still intact. <laughs> um, what's your next book like? So um, this book has at least some of Texas in it, mm -hmm. which I have been loath to uh, address. Um, you know, I, I grew up there. I mm -hmm. lived there from the time I was three until I was about 21. And, um, but the next book is all Texas. I mean, it Not is, Billings at all? Well, the, 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 the main character, who's a woman, mm -hmm. uh, has left, left Billings to return to her home, her hometown okay. in Texas. And uh, it was amazing how, I mean, you know, I took my good sweet time in getting back to Texas, but now it's talking to me a little bit, you know. I'm, my parents are getting older, my, my mom and my stepfather, and my stepfather's had some health struggles in the past couple of years, and I'm just starting to think about, um, you know, boy, 30 years of running away from it, and now I might have to... I might have to make my peace with it, so I'll do it, I'll do it in a literary sense, at least initially, before I... I mean, I like going home to Texas, but it's not home. You know, I look around and I'm just like, what? I lived here, you know? <laughs> so, Montana is much more home to me than Texas ever was, so. Well, good. It's nice to have you here. Yeah, well, thanks. Even I'm if you good. write harshly about the Fairfield bench and yeah. Great Falls. Yeah. Um, have you considered... Um, Writing more nice things about this area. <laughs> I love Great Falls. I love Great Falls. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, you know, my, my 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 seminal Great Falls experience as an adult, anyway, was going to the Sip and Dip with Jamie Ford. So um, well, that sounds you know, like a good name. Yeah, yeah. It was great. It was great. No, I I, I really do. I really do like it. It's. It, it's such a long haul. I mean, that's no, it's thing. not. Yeah, for Texas, I think we're in Texas. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's true. That's true. Yeah, uh, but uh, um, but no, I I I, have, I really have nothing against Great Falls. I enjoy every visit. So, yeah. um, so one of your most famous, your first book, is from a autistic man's perspective. Right. Um, and you have had the romantic woman. Yeah. Woman in love story. Um, the other ones are seem like they're much closer to your experience. This one, um, you used to chase a pig. Yeah. So um, that which we was, should explain. I really right? loved. Yeah. Um, just picture a pig and a man running for yeah. hundreds of miles. Like yeah. A no, a pig is a pipeline inspection gauge. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, but yes, I used to do that. I mean, my post journalism, you know, knocking around. I did pipeline inspection for a while, which not surprisingly yielded a novel that 
which actually was really good. Right? And I learned a lot about pigs, and it was yeah. great. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's. I never wanted to learn about pigs, and there they are. <laughs> it's, it's, Pipelines, who knew? It's, it's one of those jobs in America that has to get done, and it gets done fairly invisibly. Mm -hmm. um, and and really interesting, I mean, not interesting places, really flat, boring, desolate places. Yeah, oh. most of the places that you chase the pig are not places anybody chooses to go on vacation. My favorite run that we would do, and I would do it three or four times a year, was uh, just outside of Buffalo, New York, on Grand Island. And it was five miles long, that was it. You know, so it was an afternoon. And, uh, and then you're in Buffalo. So, chicken wings, <laughs> you know, beef, Falls. beef on Weck, Niagara Falls, um, uh, Fried bologna sandwiches, which are unbelievably good because they cut it like steak, okay. you know. And I don't ever think, man, I wish I had more bologna in my mouth. <laughs> well, yeah, okay. yeah, but I'm, I'm telling you, like it, it, it was worth it. Yeah, okay. uh, my friend, my late lamented friend John Arrett, who was from Orchard Park, which is right there in, near Buffalo, um, when he found out I was going to be going there all the time. He was like, oh man, I'm so envious. And he goes, mm -hmm. Buffalo is a great fat boy town. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he was right. Okay. Yeah, so. All right. Um, let's see, bologna sandwiches. <laughs> any other important things we need to know that I should have asked you about? No, no, just that, you know, uh, Northward Dreams is, you know, it's almost like four stories in one, you know, and then it converges into. Um, into the one, you know, like it all makes sense in the end. Um, but uh, I did have I remember my other question. Oh, okay. So you got sidetracked me with the blowing sandwiches. Yeah. So um, you and I and several people in this room uh, worked for newspapers, uh -huh. um, and that also factors into your stories. And you've had an interesting post newspapers life. Yeah. Um, chasing a pig. Novelist, full-time novelist for a few years. Yeah. Um, worked for the athletes. Uh, the athletic. Athletic. Yeah. The, the, I was thinking yeah. of the office athlete. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, and um, now it sounds like the most boring job in the world. Oh, but it's not. But it's not. Right? Yeah, what but is it's it? not. So I am a payments analyst. I work for a research firm, and I uh, research and write fairly dense reports about money movement, which really is fascinating once you start tearing into the infrastructure involved, you know. Uh, if you have Venmo and you use it, you know, you just take it on faith and mm -hmm. you hit a few buttons. And, but there are actually, there's this whole, this whole structure un underpinning it. And I'm really interested in things like financial inclusion. Right, mm -hmm. like how how more people can be brought into uh, the economy through digital means, um, and kind of counterintuitively, uh, places like India and Brazil have it all over the United States in that regard because in those places uh, they didn't really have an established monetary system. So when they imagined it. In, a, in digital form, and they, they gave everybody, you know, here's a cell phone, here's basic insurance, here's, you know, you make your payments through QR codes, and they, they just brought people by the millions into financial inclusion, whereas here in the United States, you know, and they, this was all government mandated, which part of the reason that it won't fly in the United States is, you know, nobody's going nobody's gonna to do that. Um, but it's, it's, it's a little counterintuitive that an established monetary system like the one here uh, is, is a little more resistant to that kind of sweeping um, inclusion. And uh, financial inclusion is one of the biggest, uh, biggest hurdles to, you know, so it's how everything. You, yeah, yeah. How, how, you, how you participate, how you, you know, buy a house, you know, in, anything, you know, there's so many people who are on the outside of the system. So I'm really, really interested in that. 
So how is this going to inform a book? I hope and how not at all. <laughs> I saw I saw your eyes glazing <laughs> over. Oh, you know, no. so, <laughs> Actuary so, tabletop. Yeah. 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 Um, well, if you can make pigs interesting, the pipeline works. Yeah. You know, what, what probably is interesting, and I, I really don't want to get on a soapbox, but... So I'm, I'm, the thing I'm really looking at now is decentralized identity, mm. right? So, so here's, here is the, uh, the thing I always use to illustrate this concept to people. So you've had a terrible week at work, you know, and all you want to do Imagine. is you, is you want to go and to a liquor store and get a nice bottle of Chardonnay and float away, right? Yeah. So uh, this wouldn't happen to me because I'm grizzled and old, but <laughs> someone, you know... As a vivacious young person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> someone young and supple like you, you know, uh, you, you go and you pick out your bottle of Chardonnay and you go up there and, and they say, ID, please. And because you've been doing this your entire life, flop it right out there, right? But that transaction is only contingent on a yes-no question, and that is, are you 21 years or older? Mm -hmm. And yet, you flop out your government-issued ID, and you tell them your height, your weight, mm -hmm. your hair color, where you live, your donor status, what kind of vehicles you're allowed to drive. And, and, you've, been do you, and you've been doing this forever because mm -hmm. you don't have a lot to fear from a liquor clerk, but you might have something to fear from somebody else in a s similar transaction. So decentralized identity on, I'm not going to sell anybody crypto, but on a blockchain where you can control who sees what, you know, like, okay, what do we need to complete this transaction? Well, I need to know you're 21 or older. Okay, well, I, I am going to... And it tells you only that... Uh, only that, not even your birthday, because they don't need to know that. They just need to know that you're 21 or older. <coughs> So it's going to be a long, hard slog to get there. Mm -hmm. The whole system is set up where the government issues all this stuff, your birth certificate, your social security card, uh, which was never supposed to be an ID piece ever. It was mm -hmm. so you could claim a benefit. So I, I find that stuff just enormously fascinating, right? Well, I yeah. look forward to your next three or four <laughs> God, I hope not. I, re I really hope not. I got a question. Sure. Okay. Um, what do you hope pe people feel after reading your, your book or take from it? More connected, you know, even if they lack connection. You know, Cherie in the 2002 timeline realizes she's the this. Alcoholic mother. Yeah, she of the alcoholic mother realizes this more maybe than some of the other characters, but, um, you know, it's. Uh, it know. feels like loving flawed people yeah. is like a major part of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, because everybody is, mm -hmm. yeah, except maybe you. Yeah, but uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but most of us, most of us have flaws. Most of us are dealing with um, mm -hmm. flawed people. You know, um, give each other a break. Maybe you know, that's that'd be big. I think we have time for one more question, if there is any. Oh, okay. Billy. What's the Fairfield bench? Oh, um, yeah. So I always have to be told, is it north or south? It's south of here, right? No, it's north, right? Um, You're out west toward... of here? Oh, okay. But anyway, it's uh, like over close to Fort By Shaw. Fairfield. Fort it's... Shaw, Fairfield. When you can drive River. to Fairfield, you go up yeah. on a bench of oh. a gay land. So it's yeah. just a formation of where Fairfield sits. And my dad grew up on a dairy farm up there. Okay. It's Shoto's, my town's arch rival and nemesis, so. Oh, okay. So, so I got my is. own issues with Wyoming and yeah. Fairfield. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm glad I'm writing to your anti-sweet spot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, okay. Well, thanks so much. I, I was thrilled to be able to come. Thanks for all the great questions. Thanks for coming all the way. Thank you.